This is a picture of the Königsberg Castle as it stood in 1895. It was the seat of power for the Germanic Teutonic Knights, who conquered and colonized many parts of Eastern Europe. It also served as the residence of the Prussian monarchy, who ruled the area until the end of the Great War. Its walls could withstand some of the heaviest bombings of the Second World War, and it became the symbol of the Third Reich's great defense of the fatherland. Historically speaking, an absolutely remarkable place. What it did not withstand, however, was Sovietization. The main castle tower came down in 1959, and its remaining structures were cleared away in 1968. In its place slowly rose up the infamous House of Soviets. Construction started in 1970 on what was intended to be the central administration building of the Kaliningrad Oblast, but it wasn't long till problems became apparent. The dense concrete structure was too heavy for the marshy soil underneath. The foundations proved to be inadequate to support the original 28-story design, so only 21 stories were completed. And in 1985, development was stopped after funding fell short. It's just been sitting there, unfinished, as a reminder of the city that once was. While today most consider Kaliningrad an outpost of Russian military, crime-infested and dilapidated, they should remember that it used to go by the name of Königsberg, and it was the only city in Europe which both Germany and the Soviet Union claimed fully as their own. It was a historic frontier where both Germans and Soviets coexisted and attempted to forge a new world. Above all, it's a place that does not deserve to be forgotten. The Teutonic Order was founded by Germans during the Third Crusade, that is, around 1190, to provide medical care for crusaders in the Holy Land. In the early 13th century, the Order launched a campaign to conquer and Christianized the Prussian tribes who lived in the region that is now northern Poland and the Kaliningrad Oblast of Russia. This conquest was a long and difficult affair, the eventual result of which was the creation of the state of the Teutonic Order, which spanned across northern Poland, modern-day Kaliningrad, parts of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Königsberg was founded during this process in 1255 on the site of an existing old Prussian settlement. The order built a castle on a hill overlooking the Pregel River, which became the center of their new state. Pregel River served as a major transportation artery, allowing goods and people to flow easily to and from the city. As a result, many German merchants came to the city and Königsberg joined the Hanseatic League in 1340 and developed into an important trading hub. Meanwhile, the dense forests and rugged terrain surrounding the city provided a natural barrier, helping to protect the city from outside threats. As a result, Königsberg grew in importance and became the capital of the state of the Teutonic Order. And as the Teutonic Knights grew in power, so too did Königsberg. Castles and fortifications were constructed to protect the city with grand churches and cultural centers, which showcased the Order's power and influence. The order encouraged German settlement in the area, and by the 16th century, German was the dominant language spoken in the city. And while the state of the Teutonic Order would weaken and dissolve, passing Königsberg into Prussian, Polish, and even Russian hands, the city remained quintessentially German in its character. This is most certainly proven through the city's production of some of the greatest philosophers of this millennium, such as Immanuel Kant, born in 1724, widely regarded as one of the most important philosophers of the modern era. His work focused on the nature of human experience and knowledge, and he is best known for his concept of the categorical imperative, which argues that actions should be evaluated based on their moral worth rather than their consequences. This emphasis on reason and rationality has always been a hallmark of German thought, with a few notable exceptions. And Kant's work is considered a cornerstone of German philosophical tradition. It would however be unfair to generalize Königsberg and East Prussia 
as only German in character. The region was very much a product of its surroundings. Lithuanian and Polish were in fact the dominant languages outside city limits, and especially on the peripheries of the Prussian state. Königsberg was also a key player in connecting Germany to the Russian Empire, relying heavily on trade with Russia for its economy and identity. In fact, some three quarters of Königsberg's port trade involved goods of Russian origin. Thanks to this vibrant trade and coming of industrialization, Königsberg's population grew from around 60,000 in 1800 to 188,000 in 1900 and 246,000 by 1914. In the wake of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, a new German state was born, forever changing the course of European history. Prussia formed a powerful alliance with several small German states and went on the offensive crushing France in 1870, marching into Paris. With the formation of a unified Germany, the balance of power in Europe shifted dramatically, alarming Britain and Russia and bringing these former rivals closer together in their efforts to contain the newfound German might. This tension eventually boiled over into the First Great War, during which East Prussia became a symbol of Germany's heroism, as it was the only major battle zone on German soil. The invading Russian Imperial Army advanced deep into the province, destroying farms and villages and coming within 60 kilometers of Königsberg. Following peace negotiations, the map of Europe changed once again. Imperial Germany was replaced with the democratic Weimar Republic and it managed to hold on to Königsberg and East Prussia. However, they were separated from the rest of Weimar Germany following the restoration of independent Poland and the creation of the so-called Polish Corridor. So as a result, for the first time in its history, East Prussia and Königsberg was an enclave separated from its fatherland and surrounded. In these tumultuous times, this was not good for the mental health of its residents. Initially, as more people in Königsberg searched for radical solutions to post-war problems, the Communists gained support as the only successful anti-democratic party, but they had a new challenger. In the end, geography and anxiety won out, trapped behind the corridor with its inhabitants fearing invasion from hostile neighbors or the infiltration of Bolsheviks. Königsberg became a breeding ground for radical German nationalism. Eastern Prussia embraced the myth of the pure Prussian man, fighting off and protecting the fatherland from the backwards Poles, Lithuanians and Russians, just as the Teutonic Knights once did. And this new nationalist party was much better at exploiting these natural fears, prophesizing of Polish, Lithuanian and Russian takeover and by pointing out the economic inadequacies of socialism and democracy in the face of the people's struggle to repay their wartime debts and the economic collapse which followed. By late 1930s, a strong Germanization effort was taking place. Lithuanian and Polish place names were replaced with German ones and their respective languages or religions, primarily Catholicism, were no longer tolerated. By 1933, East Prussia became the territory with the most support for fascist rule. In 1935, the Wehrmacht designated Königsberg as the first military district of Germany, which took in all of East Prussia. Königsberg had become a focal point for Germany's military efforts. Despite East Prussia being one of the most ethnically mixed places in Germany, it was becoming a place where the only way to be was to be a German. Des Friedens. Unless you were a Jew, then you couldn't be anything anymore. On September 1, 1939, Germany launched an attack on Poland, which marked the beginning of the Second World War. This invasion resulted in the elimination of the Polish Corridor. East Prussia was no longer a vulnerable border region. Despite Hitler's personal dislike for East Prussia, due to its marshy and mosquito-infested terrain, he spent a total of 1,000 days there, which accounted for almost a quarter of his entire time in power. 
the area surrounding the Wolfschatz, aka Wolf's Lair, his headquarters in East Prussia, became the most heavily guarded closed zone in his empire. Hitler and his inner circle planned Operation Barbarossa and the Blitzkrieg campaigns from Wolf's Lair. And on June 22, 1941, Wehrmacht Army Group North and Army Group Center launched their fatal invasion from East Prussia. Initially catching Stalin completely off guard, they pushed deep into Soviet territory, capturing Kyiv and arriving at the outskirts of Leningrad and Moscow by the fall of 1941. And as you all know, that is where it stopped. The Axis forces have had enough. Enemy detachments begin to surrender, one by one at first, in increasing numbers, as the word goes round that the German commander has capitulated. Beginning of the end for Königsberg really began in August 1944. So far, the city had been spared from the major aerial raids plaguing other German cities in the west. This ended with two nights of heavy bombardment destroying over 50% of the city and over 90% of the city centre. Almost half of Königsberg's inhabitants lost their homes and thousands were lost under the disintegrating city. The famous bridges connecting the islands collapsed into the Pregel River, leaving only two remaining. This devastation was only the beginning. As the inevitability of the Soviet invasion loomed, the military regime attempted to galvanize the population, portraying the city as the embodiment of Kant's Enlightenment values and as the last bastion of hope against the impeding red Slavic threat, a courageous martyr willing to make the ultimate sacrifice to defend Europe. East Prussia was the location of the first counter-attack on German soil. The Red Army's third Belarusian front surrounded Königsberg by the end of January 1945. The city was cut off from the outside world for the next two months with a quarter of a million soldiers compared to some 35 to 55,000 German soldiers and perhaps 8,000 militiamen inside the city. The Soviet Air Force had a significant advantage also, as there were no German fighter planes left. Despite these odds, Hitler refused to surrender, especially as the front line was approaching Berlin. He had imagined Königsberg as an invincible bastion of German spirit, and so it was. It stood its ground being fanatically defended in the face of impossible odds. Königsberg was one of the most devastated cities in Eastern Europe, nearly razed by British bombing raids and totally decimated by a scorched earth Wehrmacht retreat. In a three months long futile defense, the remaining population of Königsberg between 150 to 200,000 German civilians in the spring of 1945 were primarily women children and the elderly, as the German men had all been lost in the fighting, captured or deported as forced laborers. Soviet soldiers had little mercy to give in East Prussia. After witnessing the destruction of their own motherland, this was revenge of the most brutal kind. More German soldiers were lost between July 1944 and May 1945 than in the previous five years of the war, the majority of them in East Prussia. Back in December 1943, Churchill suggested giving most of East Prussia to Poland, but Stalin demanded that the Soviet Union be given at least a part of Königsberg as repayment. He claimed that the Soviet Union needed an ice-free Baltic seaport and also said that the territory was ancient Slavic soil, making it historically theirs. Regardless of whether anyone believed this, Churchill and Roosevelt agreed to provisionally grant northern East Prussia and Königsberg to the Soviet Union. Stalin took great interest in claiming Königsberg during wartime negotiations, but he paid little attention to it after he had secured it. The northern third of East Prussia was a mere inkblot on the redrawn map of Europe, accounting for less than 1% of new land falling into the Soviet sphere of influence. Not to mention that once hostilities were over, Königsberg was left in total ruins. Approximately 90% of the city was destroyed and only about 120,000 inhabitants had survived. The prolonged siege and heavy fighting had completely decimated the infrastructure necessary for urban life. No bridges, no roads, no railways, nothing. Electricity generators were sabotaged and water supplies were contaminated. Despite this, 
or as a result of this, Königsberg was not a priority for the Soviet Union. There was no plan or budget for rebuilding, and no established government to do so. In Berlin, for example, Soviet forces relied on German anti-fascists to help run the administration. They somewhat knew how to get things done. Here, on the other hand, the Red Army organized the administration themselves, with little guidance from Moscow and little help from local Germans. This proved to be a fatal oversight, as an entire season's worth of crops had not been grown, not to mention continual epidemic outbreaks of typhus, typhoid fever, dysentery, and sexually transmitted diseases led to the greatest infection and mortality rates in all of post-war Europe. Uprooted from the means to produce or procure their own food, the German civilians became completely dependent on their captors. By early 1946, an average of 80 Germans in Königsberg were dying each day from starvation or cold. Königsberg was renamed Kaliningrad in 1946, after the chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. Mikhail Kalinin. Although Kalinin was unrelated to the city, and there were already cities named in his honor, and despite the fact that the only real achievement of the man seems to have been surviving Stalin's purges and earning his trust. When Soviet citizens were sent to rebuild Kaliningrad, people with opposing ideologies found themselves living together in the destroyed city. Despite their differences, they learned to coexist, since it was necessary to work together just to survive. The city's previous German foundations guided the city's new development. Surviving walls and foundations dictated the placement of reconstructed buildings. Previously, German streets and towns were given new Russian identities relating to Russian heroes of the war. They planned to rebuild Kaliningrad as a beacon of socialism in the West, a showcase of Soviet cultural and technical superiority. The new society they imagined would be modern rational and clean, designed to improve the quality of life of the workers. In the fall of 1946, the Soviet Union initiated a program to settle Kaliningrad with collective farmers and industrial workers to revive the region's agriculture and rebuild its factories. So by late August, the population of Kaliningrad had grown to 90,000, with just 37,000 Germans remaining. Most of the new settlers were under 40 years old and arrived from western regions of the Soviet Union, which had been devastated by the German occupation. The collective farmers were promised incentives including free train fare, the transfer of cattle and household possessions, financial support, a loan of cereal grains and a credit of up to 10,000 rubles to build or repair a house and a release from paying taxes for three years. However, many of the new settlers still felt cheated, thinking they were coming to new German lands of plenty. Instead, they arrived in a city that needed to be completely rebuilt. For the first 10 years of the history of the oblast, the Soviet population remained unstable as people arrived, stayed for a few months, and then left after realizing that they had been duped. Life in post-war Kaliningrad was simply apocalyptic, and usually worse than where the Russian workers were coming from. There were numerous programs to rehabilitate the German population, which reveals that, at least initially, the new government assumed that the Germans would remain long term and be incorporated in some way or another into Soviet life. While many Germans were attempting and even willing to submit to re-education, they were still not permitted full integration. In practice, pay was meant to be the same for both, but in reality the Germans were always paid last and less than Soviet workers. Soviet leadership was also hesitant about giving the German people real Soviet residency or IDs. The people were stuck, trying to assimilate into a new regime, but at the same time not being fully allowed to do so. And then, shocking reports started emerging, relating to the conditions of life in Kaliningrad, some of these coming from Germans who left the city. These reports risked damaging the Soviet Union's international reputation. How could this triumphant and civilized society let such a disaster unfold within its territory. Of course, as a result, the local Soviet authorities blamed the harrowing conditions on the Germans, blaming them for thievery and a lack of morals, 
and most importantly, an inability to assimilate to Soviet ideals. Eventually, these reports led to Moscow issuing an order to purge the new Soviet state of Germans. This of course wasn't exactly what officials in Kaliningrad wanted. They merely used Germans as scapegoats in order to justify the slow reconstruction and progress in the city. They needed a labor. Germans had actually acquired the reputation for being far more skilled than their Soviet counterparts, and often possessed much needed expertise. Now they were about to lose a huge chunk of their most valuable workforce. Only the Lithuanians, a small minority of the pre-war population, were collectively allowed to stay. The resulting expulsion of Kaliningrad's Germans between 1947 and 1948 was one small episode in the largest population transfer and unmixing of peoples in human history, as between 12 and 14 million Germans left Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union in voluntary or forced migrations between 1945 and 1950. Following this, the Soviet government wanted to erase any remaining German influence, making efforts to remove German monuments and signage. In the near future, the ruins of Kaliningrad were used as a backdrop for Soviet war films that portrayed the city as a symbol of Prussian militarism. One film called Meeting at the Elbe showed Nazis and spies hiding in the ruins, further emphasizing the connection between the German architecture and the sinister political life of its inhabitants. It is telling that Kaliningrad was the top choice for shooting a film that was supposed to be portraying the last days of the Soviet invasion of Germany, even in 1949. So after the expulsions, the Soviet government denounced the ruins of Königsberg Castle as fascist and its former German inhabitants as occupiers of ancient Slavic soil. This is what probably led to the eventual and total destruction of the once great castle in the 1960s, under Leonid Brezhnev's personal orders. Despite the protests of architects, local historians and ordinary residents of the city, the old city was mostly wiped away, replaced by different buildings, different people and different values. In theory, it was to be a new hopeful start. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Kaliningrad found itself separated from the rest of Russia by independent countries. This isolation was further exacerbated when Poland and Lithuania joined NATO and subsequently the European Union in 2004. As a result, all military and civilian land links between Kaliningrad and Russia had to pass through members of NATO and the EU, turning Kaliningrad into an isolated exclave once again. And today, as tensions in Europe continue to rise, Kaliningrad has gained global attention in Western media due to its strategic location and the presence of Russian military forces in the area. While it's uncertain if nuclear warheads are present in the region, several nuclear-capable weapon systems such as ships, submarines, fighter-bomber aircraft, air defense systems and coastal defense systems have been deployed there. Moreover, there are claims of the existence of non-strategic nuclear weapons designed to be used in military situations and possibly nuclear storage sites that may have been expanded or renovated recently. With its proximity to NATO member states, Kaliningrad provides Russia with a strategic foothold, as well as a warm water port for one of its military fleets, with access to both the Baltic and North Seas. Overall, from Russia's perspective, Kaliningrad is a vital element in its ability to project power in the Baltic region especially in light of its increasingly tense relationship with NATO and the EU. If I'm being crude, Kaliningrad is now performing a similar role to what Königsberg and East Prussia used to fulfill for the German Reich, a forward military base which projects power with significant military assets and as such is indispensable to its fascist government. It's not my words, but rather the opinion of this New York Times article. And suffice to say, I believe the comparison is fair. In Kaliningrad, at least, history most definitely is repeating itself. Fascism killed this beautiful city once, and now it is strangling it once again. If another catastrophic war was to occur, Kaliningrad is set to be wiped off the map once again. But hopefully, someday, the house of the Soviets will come crashing down 
and perhaps after that, Germans will be able to return to Königsberg, and Russians will be able to continue living in Kaliningrad in peace and prosperity, as they once did. Now, how about learning about how Ukraine has ended the era of Russian in the Baltics? Click here. And this is my Patreon map. Would you like to be added? Or have some more say in what next video is about? Please join us. And many thanks to everyone on this map who has sponsored the show. Geoperspective, out.